I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable. And it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. These days, we're all investors. Trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. Entrepreneurship is painful, really painful, I would say. And sometimes I wonder about myself, like, why do I always try to do painful things? Sometimes I wish I just had a hobby like pruning bonsai trees. Like bonsai trees won't disappoint you. Yes, you could fail. Like maybe the tree doesn't look good. But you're not gonna, it's not gonna be like this brutally wrenching, threatening failure. But I talk to Jeff Lerner about entrepreneurship and my experiences in it. This is from his podcast, and we're airing it here. And uh, I'm really proud of the discussion, and I hope there's some value and some entertainment in it. So enjoy. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Unlock Your Potential. I am so lucky that this is actually what I get to do for a life. I hate the term for a living. I'm going to say for a life. I get to have amazing conversations with amazing humans, people like James Altucher, who's here with us today. And he's, uh, I think this is his second time on our show been on his show a few times. It's like just catching up with an old friend. I think it's been about a year. It's wonderful. If you don't know James, then uh, I don't know, hello on planet Zircon or wherever you are. But here on earth, he's highly esteemed as an uh, one of the most interesting humans on earth. He's uh, started 20 companies, a few of which didn't fail. He's written 20 books. Uh, I guess a book can't fail. So he's written 20 books and all, all of his books successfully became books. Um, no, he's just one of those guys that's like done a million things. He's like a, he's a chess master. He's a crypto expert. He's a software designer. He's a podcaster. He's a financial newsletter publisher. He's a hedge fund manager. He's, uh, he's a pretty cool dude too. And I'm glad he's here. James, welcome to the show. Jeff, thanks for such a great interview. I would <laughs> say books can fail when the author thinks they suck. <laughs> Like, so yeah, I look like back mission at, not accomplished, in other words. Yeah, like I look back at some of my older books and even some re- newer ones, but mostly older ones. And I think, boy, did I write that? Like, that was really awful. And not intentionally at the time, I wanted them to be good. But, you know, people, you evolve and you change. And, and I don't regret anything I've written. I just wish I didn't write some of my books. (laughs) I don't regret anything I've written. I just wish I hadn't written some of it. Well, people always, that's another thing. People always say, oh, I have no regrets. I regret quite a bit. It doesn't mean I want my life to be different, 
but it's okay. Don't punish yourself for regretting stupid shit you did earlier in life. Yeah, I I, I regret. I've, I've been. That's th- funny you say this because uh, somebody a couple of weeks ago on a podcast, that like the big closing question that they kind of like they zing you with was about regrets, and I gave this very heartfelt answer related to my mom and how she passed and blah blah blah. And since then, it was kind of the first time in a very long time that I've really been open to the idea of regret and not just given like that stock, like, oh, I don't regret anything because then I would, you know, th- what I did is what made me who I am, right? Um, and so I've been, since then, I've been kind of meditating on it. And I think what I've ultimately decided is I don't really regret the things I've done. I just regret that I wasn't better when I did them. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Like, because like, let, let's take, let's take your piano playing, for instance. Right. Like, like I could see myself in your situation and I could say to myself, boy, I regret I didn't start taking piano seriously when I was five years old yeah. instead of when I was 16, you know? Totally. I, 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 I could have been a world class. I mean, I could have been a virtuoso. And instead I was always hamstrung with muscular tension because I didn't start till I was 16. You're right. Right. And meanwhile, I'm sure many people can look at you and say, boy, I wish I could play the piano one one hundredth is good. Like you played a little on my podcast <laughs> and I was thinking that. And, uh, you know, and but then you could say to yourself, well, I don't regret it because I learned things about myself and about adult and how I could accomplish things when everybody tells me it's impossible. And that's something I can very much relate to. So maybe you could say, I don't regret it because of that. But wouldn't have you like to have been world class at a young age at something? That would have been pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, if we're if we're here to have experiences and to some degree, you can define the quality of an experience by the uniqueness or the rareness of an experience, then technically the better you are at something, the more rarefied the experience of that thing you're having, which if you agree with that definition kind of makes it all the more special. So yeah, I'm with you. So, so let's, let's jump in. Um, For context here, James and I have already been talking for like 20 minutes before I hit record. So we're kind of like, you're kind of catching us like mid podcast basically. Um, but I think one thing that I, I, I'm going to just latch on to real quick, you've written 20 books. I just wrote a book, which thank you. You, uh, you, you made a, a nice endorsement I, for. And and I'm very surprised this is your first book when you just, I didn't, for some reason, I didn't know this was your first book. And maybe you've written like big pamphlets before. I don't know. But this is very well done. You've got, you have a good mix between um, stories and information and you're not, you're not kind of like overloading it with with jargon and and slogans and and the stories are great and it's a mix between your stories and the stories of students and the stories of historical people like it's really a well a well done book. Well, my goodness, uh, James Altucher, the successful author of twenty books, just said that he likes my book and I'm grateful for that. But I will say, having written a book, and it was a very difficult thing. I have an incredible amount of respect for someone who's written 20 of them. And despite your own self-deprecation, having uh, looked at, I haven't read all 20 of your books, but I've looked at several of them and they're very good. Of my books, by the way, I'm just going to make, this is a dick move. I'm sorry. (laughs) I wrote 25. So, oh yes. No, that is not a dick move. That was a dick move for me to sell you short, man. Uh, (laughs) 25 books all only furthers my point. Talk to me about your process. I mean, just to assimilate enough information to even have 25 books worth of stuff to say, much less to actually produce it. Like, what is your your method for digesting the universe, if you will? Yeah, well, that, that's really interesting because I've been thinking a lot about process lately because I uh, about a year or two, after COVID started, I started doing these Instagram lives every day, kind of walking people it there was no reason i did it i saw that there was a lot of misinformation and this isn't political there was a lot of misinformation on both sides about covid which we could talk about in a second i happen to have right now and i wanted to kind of just clarify and interpret for people what the information was so i would have on epidemiologists and virologists as guests and you know scientists and media people and economists but also i wanted to give people things to do and so I felt like a lot of people were saying, oh, I want to finally write my book. So I would give people, I would, I would make these Instagram lives that were 30 day book challenges. Like here's how you could write a, a decent book actually in 30 days. And I would mm-hmm. kind of walk through a process of how you could do it. 
And I realized it kind of was not exactly my process for writing like a year long book or a year and a half long book, but, but similar, like let's, let's just take as an example, let's say you want to write a book about persuasion. All right. Persuasion books are popular in the right. self-help world. I have not written a book about persuasion. I actually wrote a forward for one, but I have not written one. But what I would do is kind of read all the books out there because you want to make sure in everything you write, whether it's an article, a paragraph, a blog post, a TikTok video, a book, you want to make sure that you're saying something new. You're saying something that that's specifically you so that you're putting in, in your case, the Jeff Lerner imprint on this body of knowledge. So you're not just rehashing someone else's story and everyone says, oh, he wrote a book, but then it's just forgotten. So I wanna read what's out there. And then I'll maybe look at academic research. Like I'll Google persuasion on an academic paper site. There's like a site like SSRN.com. There's a bunch of websites that aggregate academic papers. Mm -hmm. And so I'll Google, I'll, I'll search persuasion on these sites and I'll see 10 academic or hundred academic papers. And there might be 10 where there's something interesting, like use this technique in this situation. And it's a good way of using this persuasion technique. And then I'll think to myself, do I like, is this true to me? Like there's a lot of people who say persuasion techniques that aren't true to me, for instance, like, oh, when you're in a meeting, cross your legs and see if they're crossing their legs and mimicking you. And at that point you should start negotiating. You know, that stuff doesn't right. work for me. I've ne that's like science fiction. And so I've never, I've never been successful at that, but some techniques do work for me. And then I start to think, well, what, what's worked for me that is not in any of this literature and why isn't in it, this literature? Maybe I'm reading the literature wrong. And then I'll, I'll start to outline, well, what are the 10 points I want to make in this book? What are 10 different persuasion techniques that are actually useful to me, not just in the literature, but they are useful to me. And how do I know they're useful to me? Because then I'll take each item in the 10 and I'll make another list. Here's three stories where I've used this technique. Here's three stories where some famous person in, in history used this technique. Here's four stories of either entrepreneurs or friends or whatever that use this technique. And so then I have the information. I might have academic knowledge. I might, have, and then I have my personal story. So I know that I'm, I'm not feeding anybody something that I didn't eat myself. And then I have stories from history that people could relate to. So that's basically it. What are the 10 things you want to say for each one of those 10 things? What are the 10 things you want to say about that? And they should be stories mostly. And then you, then you fill in the gaps in between, write the stories, uh, write the information you want to write. And at the end you say for last, what most people mistakenly do first, which is you write your introductions, you write your outros, you write your first chapter, you write your conclusion, because it doesn't make any sense to write an introduction or a first chapter before you wrote the book, because you don't know what you're introducing yet. You gotta have something to introduce before you introduce it. Mm -hmm. Everyone writes chapter one, guess what? That's the chapter that's rewritten the most. And then by the way, that's all process and that's all then you write a book with that. You, 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 you write your 10 chapters with 10 stories in it. You staple it all together. That's your first draft. And from there, it's just a process of, you know, you write 30 more drafts of it and that's a book. So it seems like there's kind of a commonality to James and to the things that I, I see James doing and I hear of James doing. And even if I look at your books themselves, right? Like, Choose yourself, skip the line. Uh, I'm trying to think some of your other books. There's reinvent yourself. There's like a, how to manage money like a hedge fund manager. I, there was something like that, right? Yeah. There, there's, there, they all seem to have this commonality, even the way you just described the process of the book, where it's almost just like, not just like, I don't mean to be diminishing about it, it's, but it's like you're a process hacker. Like, it, would you just, do you think that's an apt description of James, the way your brain works, that like you're really into the processes of how things happen and how you can like create maps for other people to use those processes? Yeah, I think so. And not in a way that's so almost scientific, like, like Tim Ferriss is very much a process hacker. And mm -hmm. I, and I feel like I'm not quite like that, but for instance, and I'll, I'll, I'll again, use you as an example, when you're learning the piano, there's like an 80, 20 rule where 
20% of the things you study will create 80% of your skill as a piano player. It might be practicing the keys. It might be, you know, being identified to identify which sound is which note. I don't know. Or, or uh, being able to, if you can play Chopin's etudes, you can play anything. I don't know. There's, there's, there's some set of Well, for someone study. who doesn't know, you actually picked three very good 80, 20 examples. So, <laughs> right. So, so, it, 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 you know, there's some set of things that you should learn where you can essentially what I call skip the line to, so that you could be in the top, you know, one to 5% of your field, which is, which is very hard, but not as hard as people think. Like it's hard to be the best in the world at something. It's not hard to be in the top 1% at something. And so I always try to figure out how can I be in the top 1%? And the, and the benefits of being in the top 1% of a field is that that gives you an invitation to join the subculture of that field. Like yeah. I don't have to be the best ping pong player in the world, for instance, to go into a ping pong club. And if I'm in the top 1% in the world, people are going to recognize it. I'll meet the local coach and have some fun games and people want to play me. And I'm always welcome back at the club. If I'm in the top in the world, that's a different story. That's really hard. That's, you know, there's a 7 billion people, 10 people get to be in the top 10 right. in the world. But if there's, if 70 million people play ping pong, I'm just making ping pong up. 70 million people are in the, you know, if, if 700 million people play ping pong, you know, 7 million people are in the top 1%. Right. Of those 7 million yeah, that, that's a really, can I just like incubate that point for a minute? It's not as hard as people think to be in the top 1%. I think that is a, actually like a revelation for a lot of people. Yeah, it's, it is. It is. And it's, and the thing is, it's an amazing thing to be in the top 1% of anything. And like I said, you, you, you get, you, you become part of the subculture of that activity. It also feels good to master something. Being in the top 5% of anything means you're a master of that thing. It's like a black belt, you know, is not in the best in the world. It's in the top 1% of whatever martial art they're yeah. in, a black belt in. They're one in 20. And, uh, uh, and so it feels good to master something. You, you master a discipline, you master a mindset, you, you get better physically, mentally, whatever it is, you know, creatively, whatever it is that you're, you're trying to master. Um, it feels good to, to be better. It feels good to have a community. It feels good to be able to give back because if you're in the top 1% of something, chances are you could start teaching it. And, and all, all of these things are the benefits. Well, and I feel like a lot, of the, a lot of the beauty of a thing opens up to you once you have enough competence to get into that top 1%, that's where all the fine detail starts to become relevant and meaningful. And that, to me, that's the beauty in things. Like, you, you know, in, in music, 95% of what I appreciate about music, the 99% wouldn't even understand. Yeah, and that's, that's really, you know, it's funny you mentioned that. Like, so when I was 17 years old, I was starting to play chess and I, and I, you know, I was starting to get obsessed with it, uh, but I had never really played it before. And I remember I took a lesson from a guy who was very strong and he's what's called an international master, which is a higher rank than master. And I was talking to the janitor in my school about this and the janitor in my school played chess and, you know, he's an amateur player and he was playing and we were playing together. And I told him, oh, I took a lesson from this guy. And he said, that guy must be very happy. And I said, why do you think? And he said, well, for the rest of his life, he's able to enjoy this game, like the nuances of it, like you just said. And, and you're right. Once, you, once you're in the top 1% of something, you, you see so much more than when you were just casually, you know, observing it as a pat. And, you know, th this is kind of true about being alive. Like, let's say you're an accountant. People think accounting is boring. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But if you're a bad accountant, and by the way, most accountants are not in the top 5%, they're in the bottom 95%, and so they're not that good. So if you're if you're a, a, a bad or a mediocre accountant, it's not your fault necessarily. You might just not be interested in it. But then when you're doing your job and you're talking to people about their tax issues and you're helping people set up their trusts or whatever, in those moments, you're not fully alive because you're just going through these mechanical robotic robotic is the opposite of being alive. You're going through these robotic motions and it, you feel okay with it because that's what you've been doing. But again, because you're not seeing the subtleties and the nuances where every experience offers up new, exciting material and information because you're not obsessed with it, because you're not in the top 1%, you miss out on 
the the real value of being alive, which is which is having every experience deliver new, you know, joy to you. And, and it's odd making that analogy using an, an accounting example, but I think it's true for every experience we have. Like if you don't love doing something, and if you're not in that, if you're not either in that top one percent or striving to be the best you can be at whatever it is you love doing, you're not going to feel fully alive in the short amount of time we're alive. You you touched on something. I mean, and, and actually, I really appreciate this conversation um, because for context, that if you actually read the byline notes of this show, like if you go on Apple Podcasts, uh, I forget exactly what it says, but it says something like happiness is a formula as simple as it is elusive. And um, there's sort of an, impl an, an implication in the language that I created to frame this show, which I created a long time ago, but like I did what you said I shouldn't do, which I wrote the introduction before I actually had a show. Yeah. Um, but but there was sort of this connection between happiness, joy, and fulfillment and mastery. And there, and and that connection is implied by the nature of the show being about these, you know, trying to identify these simple formulas for happiness. And to get there, I'm going to interview subject like experts. I'm going to interview superlative performers at various things. And so I'm connecting those two things, right? A superlative performer with a happy person. And I think you just, you know, here it took us 210 or 20 episodes, whatever number this is, to actually articulate why that is. Because, uh, you know, one of the needs of personality is variety, right? If you go through like the Tony Robbins, Chloe Madonna's model of personality, he has like certainty and variety as a polarity. He has like, you know, what is it? love and significance, but also like belonging or connection is a, is a polarity. He has these polarities, right? And one of them says we have to have sufficient variety in our life. And so you use the example of, a, of an accountant, right? Somebody that, let's say, does the same thing professionally for 40 years. And so, at, you know, at first glance, you might go, oh, there's no variety in that. He literally is doing, you know, he's done taxes 92,000 times in his life or whatever. But the variety is in the mastery. When you get good enough at something and you have a deep enough passion for a thing, then every time out is going to be a little bit different and you appreciate those subtleties, right? So it's like you create variety through competence and, and mastery of a thing. Um, and yeah. honestly, if you're bored with something, it's probably because you're not that good at it. No, that's absolutely it. Like it all boils down to like when you play the piano, let's say you're improving. Someone said, hey, can you improv around? The movie theme for Star Wars. Out of Africa. Let's go with Out that. of Africa. One of my faves. And and make it like a little jazzy. Okay, right. now you have in your head thousands of patterns that are like jazzy kind of patterns with different chords. You know, oh, with this set of chords, I've seen this a thousand times. So I'll play around with this a little bit. Maybe I'll come up with something new. Like I'll throw in jazzy mixed with a little bit of kind of an African drum kind right. of sound. And, and you know these patterns, so you can mix them and you know how to mix them well. And, but let's say you only knew 10 patterns and not thousands. You wouldn't have as much fun. It wouldn't be as enjoyable. Now, it might be if you were using this as an exercise to develop more patterns, but it's through your mastery that you're able to now find exponentially more ways to enjoy a particular activity. Yeah, I totally agree. So I, here's what I think is so fascinating to me about you. Um, aside from the fact that you showed up to do an interview with COVID, which is just pretty magical. And, and by the way, by the way, thanks for doing that. Like you could, you, I mean, in, in today's world, you definitely would get a pass if you had been like, Hey, sorry, Jeff, I got COVID. I got to reschedule. Um, and, but, but anyway, so thanks for that. But, but here's, what's fascinating to me about you is it seems to me that you've, you've built a very successful career out of exploring things of interest. You know, I know that like you play chess. I know that you do stand up comedy, right? Correct me if I'm yeah. wrong, but like you have a comedy. Yeah. You're like, I mean, and, and you manage the hedge fund. You didn't just like, oh, yeah, I, I, I trade stocks on e trade. It's like, no, I managed a hedge fund. Like you seem to, I, I saw, so I'm, I'm detecting a theme here, which is like, I don't need to be the best in the world, but I need, I want to get into the top 1% of multiple things so that I can yeah. experience the richness that that thing has to offer. And then if I can put a few of those together, that's a really full life. It is. And, you know, look, sometimes, sometimes I have regrets. Like sometimes I say, well, what if I had just stuck with one thing for 30 years? 
instead of having this variety, then I would maybe have been in the top 10 or 100, you know, of something in the world instead of just being in the top 1%, let's say, you know, of a lot of things or, or as many things as I've, as hopefully I've tried to. And I don't know the answer to that. Like uh, whether it's, it's a regret sometimes. And sometimes I'm glad I've like, like stand up comedy. I did it for six solid years, maybe a little bit more every single day. So I was performing every single night, sometimes two times a night. Wow. Okay. And I don't want to say I got great at it, but I got good enough. I was going all over the world. And here, this is just a, in the past few years. I mean, this is from 2015 to 2021. So I was just, I was traveling all over the country and, and right before COVID, me and this other comedian, we toured all over the Netherlands. And this is while I'm running my other businesses. I didn't even tell people I was doing all this comedy stuff. And I really appreciated it by the end of it, this different way of appreciating comedy. And, and like I said, it was a part of that subculture and, and I enjoyed it. And then suddenly I didn't feel like doing it anymore. Like I did it, I'm done with it. You know, I have that particular skill set. If I give a public talk, I use those skills in, in the public talk, you know, and, and when I write, I use, I use those, those skills now when I can, but uh, I just sort of move on to, to new things. Yeah. So, so it is, I mean, it is a pretty existential and, and to some degree pointless question because you would need two lifetimes to answer it, but like, which is, which is the better path? Call it mastery to the level of richness of experience in a variety of things or mastery to the level of perhaps more richness of experience in fewer or just a singular thing. Like who knows, I mean, I, but I know they're both better than like no mastery at anything, which sadly is a lot of lives, but. You know, it, it's very interesting because for a long time I would have said, hey, it would be best to be number one in the world at something. And that might be true. Like being number one on the planet at something that other people highly esteem and that you love could be very fascinating. I don't know what that's like, but it, 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 you know, you probably at a young age, you travel all over the world, you get a lot of, uh, you meet many interesting people, you have many interesting experiences. But I was talking to Tyler Cohen, who just wrote a book called Talent. And, and he's an economist in, I think he lives in DC. And uh, he has a, a great blog, great podcast. I asked him, and he also is a, a chess player. He's, we're about probably the similar level. And uh, I, I asked him, well, you know, wouldn't it be great to be in the top 10 or the top 20 in the world at something? And he said, absolutely not. Like, look at the person who's number 15 in chess. And he said, that guy is an absolute failure to reach that level, but still not be able to hit number one. A, he's not making a lot of money compared to number one or number three or whatever. B, he's probably not very happy because he loses all the time to number one. Right. And so- well, and, and his whole life, like he doesn't, his whole life is just as focused on chess as the number one guy, probably. It's not like right. he's got a lot of free time. Right. He's probably even working harder than number one because number yeah. one is so talented. He doesn't have to work as hard as number 15. And he doesn't know how to be a stand-up comedian or write a book or- you know, run a business or these other things. So I'm starting to think variety, you know, set goals for yourself and celebrate those goals. So celebrate being, you know, celebrate improvement. Don't, don't necessarily celebrate being number X or, or top 1% or whatever, but celebrate Im your improvement and, and quantify those with small goals. And I don't say this in a cliche way. This is what I have to do because I'm always depressed if I'm not number one immediately. But, you know, if you, if you acknowledge improvement and celebrate those, it's a great experience. And then celebrate the fact that, hey, I could have a conversation with someone and, oh, when they bring up comedy, I could talk about it. When they bring up economics, mm -hmm. I could talk about it. When they bring up, you know, some business that I'm involved with, I could talk about that industry. Or you and I both have a podcast. We're able to indulge in many different topics and, and become conversational on them. It's good to be in the top 1% of interviewing because then you get a lot of information from the, the people you interview and, and absorb that information and then be able to, you know, spread it out later. So I'm starting and, and to you get to make friends that, with guys like James Altucher. If you're Jeff Lerner, I mean, it's it, for networking. It's incredible. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, look, you, you played the piano on my podcast. Like we were going to do a podcast about entrepreneurship and I got you to play the piano. <laughs> yeah, that's so true. You, you got great. me to, I think, I think you got me to reharmonize jingle bells. If I remember that. <laughs> 
<laughs> uh, maybe, yeah, I think it was something like that. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to, or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play. Even if one of your players gets injured for football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So, I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to a hundred dollars. That's the easiest hundred dollars you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James daily fantasy sports made easy. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But people in general love learning and are curious. Like the key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're, they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking. Dan Brown on writing. Or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast, on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I, I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one -on -one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov? You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Memberships start at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one -on -one classes with all 180 plus masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180 plus masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use Masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So this holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash J-A-S. 
J-A-S, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash J-A-S. Masterclass.com slash J-A-S. Offer terms apply. So I, I feel like I, I feel like we need to interject here. Just a moment of sensitivity and potentially I, I actually don't know if we have anything to apologize for, except making maybe perhaps making assumptions to Jan Christoph Duda, <laughs> who is the 15th ranked chess player in the world. I just Googled it. And uh Jan, I wish you well, man. I have no idea if we're talking about if we're nailing your life or we're just completely off base, but dang, I hope you're happy. Oh. It's it's a good example because that's not the guy who Tyler Cohen and I were talking about. But I read an, uh, I did. Well, it's probably well, the point is it's probably already changed. Like oh yeah, it changes yeah. every day. But I did read an interview recently with Jan Duda, and um, he said I always knew since I was a little kid that I was going to be the world champion. And I appreciate that he's saying this with a lot of confidence. He's still assuming he will one day be the world champion, and who knows, maybe he will be. But my guess is he will never be the world champion. He's 15th in the world, and I've seen his games. I've watched his games live. I've watched him play the world champion. He's just not going to do it. I don't think. That's my personal opinion. So, he, he, I don't mean to insult him or anything. Well, so this is, let's let's talk about this because I am, you know, I, I feel like we we share this common trait, which, by the way, is a very entrepreneurial trait, which means it's totally at home on the show because the vast majority of, of the audience, I believe, are either either currently entrepreneurs or seriously considering going that direction. Um, and it's the trait of this, like you talked about, that you, you were starting to get obsessed, right? Like you have that switch that will flip yeah. about a thing and you'll get obsessed. And, and for you, you're like, oh, well, I was one of the best and I toured for six years as a stand-up comedian. But the reality is whatever it took to achieve that, whether it was in chess or podcasting or managing money or stand-up comedy, probably represents you know, let's call it like red zone level RPM exertion for most people, right? Like you gotta, you gotta, you kind of gotta take it to the, to the extreme to get really to get great at anything. So, yeah, so do. let's talk about that. The, the point where the, what maybe it's the point of diminishing returns inside of obsession is what we're really talking about. Cause ultimately the goal here is to help people be happy and successful and really successful is only successful insofar as it's part of being happy and fulfilled anyway, and and then like not dying of starvation, right? So so let's let's take Jan Duda, and who I know nothing about by the way, except that he has a fifteen by his name, and Magnus Carlson, who I'm sure you're quite familiar with, who's got yeah. a number one by his name, and and like what do you feel like is that distinction? Is it it, it yeah? I mean, contextualize that distinction for me, and then. And then let's try to sort of like weigh it in terms of life satisfaction. Yeah, it's a really interesting question because, and this is this is why Tyler Cohen and I were talking about this because he wrote a book called Talent. And so at that level, they're all extremely talented. Like they all have some innate thing. We don't know what it is, some magic fairy dust that makes them great at what they do that other people don't have. And, you know, to get in the top 1% as opposed to the top 10 in the world, you, you, you need to know that it's good to know as much as possible, but there's, there's shortcuts. Like, like we were talking about, if you, if you were learning a foreign language and you know the 500 most popular words, you could probably right. get by speaking that language. So you could be in the top 1% of foreign speakers of that language. But but to really speak fluently like a native speaker, you kind of have to know everything. And, you know, th there's no, like when I'm studying chess, I'll focus on, oh, if I get better at this, my overall game would improve. That's not true for these guys. They have to get better every day at everything. They have to get, just be the, be there's no shortcut. They have to be great at everything. If you're a tennis player, you can't say, oh, hopefully nobody will realize my backhand is not so good and they won't hit it there. So I'm just going to focus on my forehand. Everyone's going to hit to your backhand. Once they see, you know, at that level, they see your weaknesses easily. They'll just hit to your backhand and you, you're not going to be a good player. So, you, so Jan Duda and Magnus Carlsen, they have to know everything. And, and what Magnus Carlsen has is he has 
he has an ability and a motivation to learn, to really learn everything. He never gets bored of the game. He never uh, uh, slows down. His memory, in terms of talent, his memory is perfect. You could show him a position and he'll say, oh, and wasn't that from 1957? You know, Boris mm -hmm. Spassky won the under 12 Moscow tournament uh, and, and, and with this game in round three, like he has an amazing memory. And he's, he, he's he has studied every aspect of the game. He's by far the best player. Maybe he'll be the best player ever. Who knows? But, you know, every area continues to improve. But it's even hard to imagine who's ever going to be actually better than him. And, and Duda pl it plays amazing. He would beat me 100 times out of 100 times. And he, you know, he, maybe he likes to play his games a little extra wild or, or attacks a little bit much. He doesn't play... He's not as much of a machine as, as Magnus Carlsen is. So it's it's hard to say, but there's because I asked this question too. There's some level by which they just didn't really want to learn everything in some small nuanced area of the game. Well, is it is it potentially that there's even an area of self that they didn't want to go where maybe it's not even a chess specific aptitude or 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 nuance it's yeah, maybe yeah. almost like a like what 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 amount of work would i have to do to be as disciplined as magnus carlson or as as vicious as magnus carlson you know it's almost like character based not talent -based. I, I totally think you're right like in the last world championship and i don't, I don't want this to be boring to your readers about Chess, but this applies to everything. Well, do you remember before we hit record, I said, I've decided that podcasting is just about having the conversations I want to have. And if people want to listen, they can't. <laughs> that, that's true. And I, I, I like that approach a lot. And so it, it, this is very interesting because it's like how to be a world champion. So Magnus Carlsen was playing against this very great player. Obviously, he was the challenger for the world championship. He's the number two player in the world. His name's Jan Nepo Niachi. So people call him Nepo. And Nepo who's an amazing attacking player. To watch his games is like a work of art. But he, against Magnus Carlsen, he made these trivial blunders, like, like mm -hmm. a move someone even ranked lower than me would, would make occasionally. And people in the press conference afterwards asked him, why did you make that move? And he just shrugged his shoulders and said, you know, I don't know. And I'm going to spend a good deal of time after this match. Me and my team will be trying to figure it out. Like, and I like the fact that he included his team. Like he's going to be working at figuring out what site he, he doesn't play that poorly. He should have seen those moves in seconds and microseconds. It should have been instinct and something psychological in him. Like maybe he was nervous. Maybe he was overconfident. I'll give you an example from me. That was very frustrating. So I stopped playing in tournaments when I hit the master title in chess. I was New Jersey's junior champion at the age of 18. I played a few more years and then I stopped playing in tournaments and I stopped playing for 25 years and I just restarted again. Everyone told me you can't possibly restart at the age of 54 and be good. And you're never going to get as good as you were before. And you're certainly not going to get better. And I'm convinced of course that I will be. And, and, and by the way, you're not devoting yourself to it full time. Like you still have a career and businesses and family well, and life and, Oh yeah, but to your point about obsession, even today with COVID, I woke up at 5 a.m. and I spent the first four hours of the day studying okay. chess. Okay. So that's what I do every day. That success clue right there, everyone, by the way. J you yeah. Know, from James, thank success you. Success or misery, depending on what happens. But uh, Sixes, so man. Those are sixes. <laughs> so so the, the, the last tournament I played in, I started off amazing. It was like, I played, I played, I beat, I played and beat the two highest ranking players I had ever beaten in my life. Even when I was younger and now I destroyed these first two. And then the third game, I was playing the number 43 ranking player in the world, a very talented prodigy. And I was beating him. And our reason I know is, you know, later on I looked at the computer and throughout most of the game I was winning. And then I even had a winning move which I could have seen, and it wasn't beyond my abilities to see it, where I could have won that game. And then even the fourth game, I was playing the U.S. Women's Champion or the former U.S. Women's Champion, 
And she was like, why didn't you just make the obvious move here and win? And, but I wanted to, I, I, I didn't do it. I, I, and I even had seen the move she was pointing out. And so what happened was I won those first two games, again, proving to myself I could beat people higher rated than I've ever beaten before. So I was on my way to being better than I've ever been. And then I lost the next six games in a row. And mm. I ended up losing to people much weaker than me as well. So I wasn't just playing. All, once you start losing, you play weaker and weaker players. And so I don't know what happened. Like it was clearly a psychological thing where I was beating these incredible, like world-class players. And then I was losing the players ranked much weaker than me. It's not about the chess. I proved to myself I could play at that world level, but there was something psychological. And that's really what I've been since that tournament. That's what I've been working on and talking to sports psychologists and other yeah. athletes. And, and I don't know what, what the issue was. One theory I have is that maybe I thought since I was playing so well against the strong players that I should easily destroy the weak players. So I didn't give them enough respect at the board. So I didn't play consistently. And no matter what you do in life, you have to be consistently good. Like if you're a lawyer, you got to treat every client like the most important client in the world, or you could, you could lose their case. And that means their life to them. And somehow I think I didn't have that consistency of, of focus. And I, I need to work on that. Yeah. So so it's interesting. First of all, I want to I want to address something I said when I was sort of very flippant about the audience. Um, the reason it doesn't bother me to feel that way is because the the audience that's right for this show is here for the same thing I am, which means by nature, we're we're always going to be aligned because I'm what I'm seeking here in this show is that essence, that distillation of success and and elite performance and fulfillment and, and outlier results. And, and, and so that's where I'm naturally going to go anyways. And that's what I'm inviting everyone to come with me. So it's not that I disregard the audience. It's just that I already know we're on the same page. So I just want to kind of clean that up. But, but, the, but I also have learned to trust the process, the conversational uh, intelligence, yeah. if you will, that we always get where we need to go. And I feel like we're starting to get where we're supposed to be, which is around this concept of, of the elite levels of mastery. And I kind of feel like what you're saying, and, 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 and again, for knowing that the audience is, is largely entrepreneurial, I mean, entrepreneurship, you know, it's, it's not a coincidence that I so often in these conversations end up talking about sports or the arts or some other form of competitive performance-based endeavor. Because that's really entrepreneurship is very much like one of those oh, things, right? Oh, yeah. Like, look, I don't play any sport, but I love sports movies. I just watched, mm -hmm. um, I think it was called Hustle or Hustler with Adam Sandler. About oh, I've basketball. heard that's really good. I haven't seen it, but I heard it's great. It's great. And I watched Winning Time, which was a Showtime series about the Lakers. I, I, yeah. I also recently watched The Natural, an old movie about baseball with Robert Redford. I don't play Have you watched A Man movie. in the Arena, the Tom Brady documentary on Hulu? No, I oh, haven't. Oh, good. You talk about the what the stuff that we're talking about here, right? Like those those fine degrees of distinction between number two and number one or number 10 and number five. I mean, Tom Brady for 22 years has been the best. Almost from the second he hit the field when when Drew Bledsoe got hurt. And so this is, I, I think this is so interesting. And it's it's kind of like when people talk about Michael, like let's say like a Michael Jordan versus a Magic Johnson or a Michael Jordan versus a Larry Bird, or even versus a LeBron James. The reality is, in a series that meant the most, Michael Jordan just, he wasn't going to lose, period, ever. It just wasn't going to happen. He went to the six consecutive playoffs, six consecutive finals, six consecutive championships. He just wasn't going to lose. And you can't say that, really, about, about any, any of his peers that are in that same, you know, goat of modern basketball conversation. And so understanding that distinction which is really kind of what you're saying, where it's like when James, and by the way, I am, I am implying that Michael Jordan has an edge over in basketball over what you have in chess. I hope that is. Yes, matter. yes. Um, <laughs> but but okay. it, begs a, it begs the question though, of what is it deeply in James, and, and it sounds like you're, you're soul searching on this, that would not continuously elevate to the level of your own ability and beyond Whereas the pressure increased, the performance increased, period, the end. Like, what, what was yeah. it? Do you, do you think that you're potentially, 
you're actually scared of the ramifications if you were truly one of the best in the world, because then you would, it would like upend your life. Like, what do you think it is? I don't think it's that. Cause I don't, <clears throat> I don't think I, you know, I don't think I could reach that level necessarily. Although, you know, I don't want to say one way or the other, but here I was playing at a very elite level in those first two, even, even the games afterwards where I, I, the first game or two afterwards where I lost, I was still playing at a, a very high level. And then suddenly maybe I almost, I really don't know. I've been really trying to come up with answers of like how I could play so well in the beginning at a level I'd never played at before kind of proving everyone wrong that I couldn't right. play at that level. And then, and this is after about six months since returning to tournaments and really studying and, and so on. And then suddenly just falling apart. Like maybe I wanted to almost give myself an excuse like, Oh, I lost cause I didn't take it so seriously. Like what if I had taken it really seriously and then lost, Yeah, you know, but, but I thought I was taking it seriously at the time, but I also really did think I was, going into each game that I was just going to crush this person. Yeah, but, but to be clear, I mean, the conscious mind can process, what, 40 bits a second in the or 400, and the subconscious process is like 2 million. So whatever we think we're thinking is never the whole, the totality of what we're thinking. It's not even right. else. Right. That's why I don't even know how to approach this problem. Like sometimes, so I have a, obviously like when you, when you get good at something, you have a coach. And so I went over with, with my coach these games and like, so it's, it's clear, it's easy to see, oh, well, here's where you made a wrong move. And I said, no, I know where I made the wrong move. Like, that's kind of easy. I want to know why I made the wrong move. Yeah. And what was I maybe thinking? And, and this is where, you know, just talking to a bunch of people, maybe I didn't appreciate, I didn't stay consistent, that I thought it would be too easy. So I was trying, my brain was almost trying to conserve energy subconsciously by not playing as hard against weaker players. And so that's why you tend to, in any sport, you tend to kind of rise to the level of, of the person you're playing. And, you know, also maybe there's, maybe there is a slight age thing where, you know, I was getting tired after like five, six, seven mm. rounds. Each, each game is like five hours potentially. And it's, it's tiring. Interesting. But yeah. Magnus Carlsen once said he lost, he loses six to 8,000 calories a day when he plays in a chess tournament. Wow. Because the, the brain burns up a lot of calories. So, but I honestly don't know. What it is? I was going to ask you for advice. What do you What do you think it is? <laughs> well, it's it's interesting. I mean, because you did you did allude to essentially, in not so many words, fear of success, right? Like, what does it mean if this if I don't lose, right? And and the reason I'm pursuing this line is not because I mean you're 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 probably you might be the only person that will ever hear this episode that's that into chess, right? Like that's it's not because there's other you know an audience of chess players. But there is an audience of competitors and there is an audience of performers. There's an audience of entrepreneurs and there's an audience of people that if you're an entrepreneur, you have set, and, and frankly, even if you're an employee, like just if you're a capitalist or you're part of a capitalist system, you've said yes to an environment where how, 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 how far up you rise has a lot to do with your psychology and the choices you make and the commitments you make, right? And so I think we're all in this conversation together, even if it's, you know, whether it's chess or something else. And so what's interesting to me, you know, and, and I'm asking for me a little bit selfishly where my career, like, I, I don't, I don't want to rise, you know, there's a saying you rise to the level of your incompetence, right? Yeah. I'm actually terrified of the day that I realize I can't rise any higher because I found my ceiling. Like I do not, I'm, I'm just gonna be honest. I don't ever want to experience that day. And that's why this conversation is so interesting to me is like, I want to be ready now for the time when I find myself, when everybody thinks I'm not ready, but I actually proved that I am because I was getting ready now. That's why these conversations are interesting to me. And so, you know, let's, let's say my book takes off. Let's say it's a number one bestseller. And now I'm invited on, you know, a national TV show to give an interview. And then, you know, they want to meet me at the White House. And then Tony Robbins wants to have me on stage. And that, like, you don't know. All yeah. I know is if those things happen, I don't want to not be ready. That's why this conversation matters to me. So I don't know. Do you think that maybe you actually are afraid of becoming too successful at that thing? It's a, it's a tough question. Cause like I was thinking about this earlier also, like when I was younger, I never thought I had a plateau. I thought I could rise to be, 
you know, when you're young, you think you could be the best at anything. And, and maybe you can because you're young and you have the time and you have the years ahead of you and you have the physical conditioning and so on. And me and only now I realize, oh, I will hit a plateau at everything I ever do. Oh, <laughs> like, yeah. Like it will happen. And I never yeah. used to think of that as a kid. Like, oh, when I was a kid, if I was playing like a grandmaster at chess, I would think, oh, I had just as much chance of beating him as anybody else. And now I just don't think that way anymore. And even though it might not be true, I might have a, I have a better chance now than when I was a kid. Maybe that's the wrong way to think, like to think that you have a plateau. Maybe don't give yourself a plateau and don't be afraid of hitting that plateau. Like maybe you're right. Maybe well, I'm afraid. I, maybe a, a question is, level. does anybody ever actually reach their potential? I would say like probably Magnus Carlsen, the number one player in the world, or, or let's say the number one tennis players in the world. Uh, I don't know who it is right now, but they probably hit their potential. I think number one hits their potential. And so that's why it's tricky because only one person out of billions could be number one in anything. That's why it's good to be satisfied with top 1% or top 5% or whatever it is. And it's also important to celebrate the small goals. Like, like the important thing is not being number one. The important thing is improvement. Like that is what makes, like you were alluding to it earlier, that's what makes you happier is when you're improving at something you love doing. Not being number one in something, because then you always have to defend it. It's not that, you know, it's stressful or whatever. But improving and appreciating the nuances of improving is important. And maybe there's a feeling like, I don't know if I'm scared of success, but I am scared of the fact that I think there's a plateau. And so that makes me nervous. Uh, so maybe that's, maybe that was, you're like, okay, if I can lose in a way that I can, I can call a blunder, then I don't have to experience losing because I found my ceiling. Yeah, that be that that these people were legitimately just better, and I worked really hard, and that's it. Man, okay, so so this, I mean, James, this is gold right here. Because um, again, I was playing the guy who's number forty three in the world, and I was, you know, I had at one point I had a winning shot, and and then I couldn't win the next five games. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but I mean, how many people listening and, and just, you know, you, you, you come across a lot of people that are very aspirational. Hey, James, how do I this? And, and so often I, I got to assume you see the same thing I do, which is uh, oh, so much of it is around, you know, it's around fear. It's around self-sabotage. It's stopping short. It's not taking the leap. It's not going all in. It's, it's not, burnt, you know, quote unquote, burning the boats, right? And so I think understanding the nature of self-limitation and 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 being able to parse out the the facets of fear is i mean that's you know the show is called unlock your potential right like i i got to think that's part of the code well it, and it's very much this this all relates so much to entrepreneurship like when you start a business what if you throw everything into it like you spend 12 yes. hours a day at it you put your money in it you put your relationships on the line because of this business is going to work and then what if it just doesn't work? You just tried your best for years. You gave up something. You sacrificed. And what if you just, what if there's no excuse? It just, the business just didn't work. That's worse pain than, oh, well, COVID happened. And, you know, my business, my restaurant shut down. It wasn't my fault. Or, oh, my partner yeah. ran away with all, you hear all the excuses in the book. My partner ran away with all the money and I had to shut down or there was a fire and or I couldn't find good employees, blah, blah, blah. People always have reasons why their businesses didn't work. But it's never like, you never hear someone say, I put everything I had into that. I don't know what else I could have done. I lost my relationships, my friendships, yeah, and, it, yeah. and then my business failed. And, and, and even go further and say, and the reality is I found my ceiling and I just wasn't good enough and I couldn't get good enough. To make yeah. It work. And, and by the way, then, then that means you can delegate the next business in those right. areas where you weren't good. Like it's still, which, which is not an option in chess, by the way, you can't hire someone to like guard right. your, your rook. Right. Right. Yeah. Like, Hey, okay. Now I've, I've brought the game this far. You guys step in, right, right. they go over here. So, so, but, but business could be a very individual thing as well. Like when it, particularly when it starts out, it's kind of just you, it's uh 
uh, you know, you don't have like a whole team in the beginning. And it's, it's, if business is scary, it's scary to fail a business. I've, I've failed a lot of business and, and it's, it's a shameful thing. Do, I'm do, you, do you think that it is overly reductionist to say that at some level, all limiting fears are fears of self-revelation? Self-revelation in the sense that like finding out a deeper truth about yourself that you just really don't want to have to deal with. Yeah, that, that could be like, that could be, that could very much be like, like, I don't want to find out how good I could be because then I have to also find out how much better I can never be. I feel, I feel like I'm not worried as much as that is I'm afraid that I'm not good enough. So, so sometimes, and, and now I'm talking business, Sometimes I won't, you know, they say you have to be, and I believe this is true. If you want a business to succeed, you've got to be a hundred percent focused on your business, which is by the way, different than a business that is 100% focused on a one product, but you have to be a hundred percent focused on your business. Mm -hmm. You have to be, you know, you have to love it. You have to innovate. You have to create, you have to reach out to people. You have to have interactions with customers and shareholders and, partners and call them up every day and make those extra calls that no one else is, is, is making. And maybe sometimes in businesses that I've done that have not worked out, I have not done that because if I did that and then failed, what does that say about me? Yeah. I didn't want to know. Oh my gosh, I love these clothes. Mizzen and Maine, that's M-I-Z-Z-E-N and Maine. It really is the most comfortable work clothes. Travel clothes, I'm tra I am had to travel this whole week. I'm traveling for a week and a half and I just took Mizzen and Maine clothes with me. Close out 2023 in style with comfortable, breathable, packable and machine washable pieces from Mizzen and Maine. As you wrap up your year-end goals, enjoy a Mizzen and Maine dress shirt that you can wear confidently. I like that they've very, very just nice, solid colors. I don't really like to get all fancy in patterns and everything, although they do have some pattern shirts, but very comfortable clothes, stretchable pants. It's just super comfortable, but they look professional and they, you can wear them casually or professionally. I like some of their flannel shirts or untuck shirts. I love untuck. I never tuck in. So again, uh, whether you're shopping for a special someone or giving yourself the gift you really want, I just buy myself gifts. Mizzen and Maine is the perfect gift for any guy who works, travels, and or cares about looking and feeling great. As you could tell by my many photos across the internet, I care about looking fantastic. I'm practically a model. And let's be honest, Every guy loves to look great. So again, shop now at mizzenandmain.com and save 20% when you spend $130 or more using promo code James. That's promo code James at Mizzen and Main, M-I-Z-Z-E-N and Main.com. This is such a valuable service for all business owners, big businesses, small businesses, doesn't matter. I wish I had this in the many different businesses that I've started. Sometimes it seems like your business is humming, but then suddenly you don't understand it. You're starting to fall behind. You're not understanding what where your costs are, where your revenues are, where, where your payments are. Teams are buried in all sorts of like BS work and you can't seem to close the books. So you need like one dashboard, one source of truth. I'm jealous of this business, NetSuite from Oracle, of course, NetSuite by Oracle. I wish I'd come up with this idea. It's, it's, it's a brilliant concept to have all your business intelligence on one dashboard. This is why you need to know these three numbers, 37,000, 25, and one. So 37,000, that's the number of businesses which have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, streamlining accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, and more. 
25. NetSuite turns 25 this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. One, because your business is one of a kind. So you get a customized solution for all of your key performance indicators, your KPIs, in one efficient system with one source of truth. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need to grow all in one place. So right now, Download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash James. That's netsuite.com slash James to get your own KPI checklist. netsuite.com slash James. Okay, so man, we have plumbed these depths and I'm so I'm honestly so glad we did and and I hope everybody listening was able to take the, you know, what became a metaphor of chess and map it to the larger experience of entrepreneurship and really just going for it in life, trying to live that that life that we were we were destined for. So, I'm curious and and are you good on time? I know I, we we yeah, decided yeah. okay, yeah, because I I would actually like to pivot. I think you have a fascinating concept that you've been developing that I first heard about a year ago when we, I think, last spoke, but it, I, I see that it still exists and you're still working on it. And I'd love to talk about it. Um, you have a website called notepad.com, which is, it's there's no A, it's notepd.com. Um, but I love this idea around generating 10 ideas a day. So can you just like unpack that concept for us? Yeah. And I'll, I'll try to tell the story as quickly as possible. But like when it's like literally 20 years ago. It's odd. It's actually now I'm thinking about it. It's 20 years ago, literally almost to the day. I had already built and sold a business, but I then I had done some poor investing. I didn't know anything about investing then. And I went totally broke and I was losing my home and I was so depressed. It was, you know, we've heard this story a lot from a lot of entrepreneurs and I didn't know how to get out of this depression. But one day I took like a waiter's pad and I was in a cafe and I just started writing down 10 ideas. And I did it the next day, just 10 ideas for businesses, 10 ideas for a book, 10 ideas for chapters in a book, 10 books this other writer should write, 10 ways this hotel can improve, blah, 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 on and on. And I did it every day, one idea list a day. And after like a few weeks, even, I felt like happy for the first time in years. Like I had been really wow. depressed about losing all my money. And somehow or other, this, you know, I, I, it sort of felt like a muscle was building. Like we have this idea muscle and it atrophies really quickly. And so suddenly I was connecting neurons that were, had been out of use and they were building up and they were lighting on fire with each other. Like, oh, hey, we're meeting again. And then I started using my idea list. So let's say I had 10 ideas for or this one hedge fund manager. Here's 10 investing strategies I think you would be interested in based on what I know about you. And I started sending these out and people started responding to me. Hey, these are great ideas. Can we have coffee? And <clears throat> it became a very, it, to this day, by the way, I mean, it just happened to me yesterday. I sent 10 ideas for someone. Here's ideas for your business. And he wrote back and he's like, oh my gosh, like this is out of the blue. I would love to talk to you about these. And I'm like, no, 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 these are for you. Like, you don't need to talk to me about them. Just if you like them, go for it. So this is a very successful technique I've used for networking, for creating opportunities for myself. Because of idea lists, I sent cold to Google, Amazon, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter. I have visited all of those companies completely cold, sending out mm -hmm. these idea lists. And for tw the past 20 years, and it's really helped in times of, you know, when I need opportunities or when I need ideas or when I want to start new businesses or write new books, this, I, I, for 20 years, every day, I write 10 ideas a day. And I've written about this and other people started doing it. And they said, this is amazing. I feel like an idea machine. And, you know, people who read my books, thousands of people were writing me saying, this is an incredible habit to do. And they said, why don't you make a website where we could do this and I can keep track of my idea list. And I'm like, nah, I don't even keep track because it's just to exercise. I don't have to keep, I don't watch videos mm -hmm. of myself working out in the gym, just do it. And then the next day you do it again. But then I decided, okay, I'll make a website. And so I made a website where 
you can write down it has, by the way, the website has all the functionality of Twitter. So it has like status updates and messaging and you can follow people and you could comment and all that stuff. But then it also allows people to make idea lists and it also allows you to search idea lists. So if I go on there and I search crypto, I could see anybody who wrote uh, an idea list about cryptocurrencies. Or if I write books, I could see anybody who wrote an idea list about books. And then I could follow people and I could comment on. So there's a community that's developing around these idea lists and there's accountability. Like I can't just scribble something down on a waiter's bed. I have to kind of write a, a well thought out. So I started using my own site. I was the first user, of course. I guess we launched 150 days ago because I've now written on the site 150 idea lists in a row. So we keep track of the streaks. We keep track of what posts are trending. So we, we, we make it interesting for people to visit. And we haven't had any official launch, but we we had 60,000 visitors last month. There's there's about five or 6,000 idealists written on there. And I, it's very easy to just, because they're so creative, some of these lists, I can just read them and keep scrolling. So that, I'm going fun. through it right now. And this is, I can see, like, I could totally get lost in this. This is a hundred times more interesting to me than Twitter. And that's what people have been saying about it. So I feel like, there's a real community developing and there's really great content. And so I decided to add one more thing, which, which we're about to release, which is what I call premium idealists. So you can make a list, like you could say 10 top tips for how to make a uh, real estate business. And you could charge, you can make it premium and charge $5 for it. And so now mm. most of the lists on there are public and people could see, but you can make ones, anybody can make ones that are premium and charge for them. And so, if people will pay, they'll pay. So if it, something has like real commercial utility, like if I made a list, it was like 10 little known ways to optimize your e-commerce store. Yeah, exactly. That's something that people could get thousands of dollars of value for and they'll totally pay five bucks to read the list. Yeah, 10 yeah. stocks you should buy, you know, in a recession. Right, right. $10 or $100, whatever you want to charge. And then, you know, we'll give people the email lists of everybody who pays for their stuff. And, you know, and also you can make idea lists that are private. So sometimes I have an idea list that I don't want to share with the whole world. So I'll, I'll still write it down so I can keep track of it, but I'll just label it private. So there'll be private gotcha. public, premium. You know, I still haven't decided what to do with it. Although maybe that's an excuse. Maybe I'm afraid to go all in and say <laughs> right. this is the business. And You're afraid to be the next Jack Dorsey here, right? Yeah. But it, it does seem like it's deserving of work. And I'm excited to to launch this premium thing. And, and even as it is, the site's kind of finished as is. We even have an AI engine in there where if you come up with four ideas and need help with the next six, the AI engine is pretty good at filling out the next Oh, six. wow. Yeah. And, and we also have collaboration. So I could make the, uh, an idealist and I could say, hey, Jeff, if you want to add to this, I added you as a collaborator. So other people could add to lists. And you could branch off of, I, oh, another critical feature is you can create a challenge. Like you could say, you know, what are the next 10 movies I should watch? That's the challenge. And, and people will make lists responding to your challenge. And I could keep track of who's responding to my challenge. Or a company could say, you know, which of these ads should we use? Or what, ad, what type of ad should we have? And people will respond to those challenges. So a company could even use it as like a suggestion box. Like, hey, what are 10 things we could do to improve efficiency and have it, their employees collaborate and contribute ideas? A absolutely. And then it'll rank the responses by how many likes uh, each, you know, list, each response. So it's, like, yeah, it's, so it's like Quora where you can like upvote and downvote yeah, kind of. Okay. Exactly. And, and I can even branch off of an idea. So this is like a, for writing a book, for instance, I could write, uh, uh, you know, here's the, the 10 ways to get better at tennis. And then the, the next day I could branch off of my, there's a button to branch off of my first idea and I could write, oh, here's 10 ways to make my forehand better. And so mm -hmm. it could be a, a book writing process. So I've even had publishers speak to me about this, a tool that their authors could use. And so there's something here, there's, a, there's meat here and people are using it and people like using it and, and it grows every day. There hasn't been a single day where we haven't added users. Uh, and I just haven't really, we just haven't launched yet. So, huh. uh, well, I, what, what I, I'll tell you what I love 
is this idea of, of working out your idea muscle. I literally had a, a call this morning with somebody internally in my company. Um, and they were asking me, you know, essentially they're like, Jeff, how do you, how do you seem to have so many ideas for content? How do you, like I create content, you know, pretty prolifically. And I basically said, and I, and I asked them, I said, how many, how many days a week do you create content? And they said two. And they said, well, that's that. I mean, that's it. I do, I do it every day. I like I I have trained my reticular activating system to be obsessing, obsessively scanning my environment on a daily and even hourly basis to find the the grains of of content. But yeah, and, and, and so I, but but it is it's a muscle and they atrophy quick. It atrophies really quick. Like if I I know this even for writing. If I don't write, you know, every day after two or three days, I could sense it. Like I'm not writing as well yeah. or. You know, um, but de definitely with ideas like like yesterday, I didn't know what my idea list would be. I sat down. I have COVID. I'm tired. I was, you know, should have been asleep already. But I re I remembered. Oh, I got to do the idea list on on Notepad. And so I had this weird idea, like ten ten stories in the Bible. I wouldn't mind writing a novel about with with an interesting twist. Huh. And so I had like ten ideas, like you know. There's all sorts of weird little stories in the Bible that most people don't know about. And some of them could be interesting, like dramatic stories. Yeah, so, that's so that's so cool. But and I think the reason this is so valuable, and, and I'm I'm gonna suggest that A, I'm gonna I'm gonna play with the site some and, and encourage others to too. Whether it's frankly, whether it's my friend James's notepad site or a notepad you keep on your phone or on your desk, it doesn't really matter. But this idea of the regular uh generation of ideas. You know, I think we live in a world now where there's a real issue of saturation in, in virtually anything. Um, you know, there's there's kind of like as, as automation continues to evolve, efficiency and productivity increases. I think about like every market, like, you know, let's say I live in a town called, with 250,000 people. And let's say that it used to take, you know, there, you used to need to have one insurance agent for every thousand people, right? Because you got to handwrite the you got to underwrite and you got to snail mail and it's like just less efficient, right? But now I'm sure they've created software that allows one insurance agent to service 50,000 people in, in a territory, right? Because it's just everything can be done faster. And so that means 49 out of 50 insurance agents have been made redundant by the efficiency improvements of being an insurance agent, right? And I think that's true across everything. I had a conversation with a pharmacist okay. the other day about how like, you know, pharmacy, the expectation of a pharmacist is three times what it used to be. And so I think in the world today, the ability to figure out and come up with new ideas and new ways of doing things is actually your only long-term insurance against becoming made irrelevant or, or, or being consumed by the increase in efficiency that makes you less needed. Yeah, I, I 100% agree. Like I, the first sentence of my book, The Choose Yourself Guide to Wealth, which I wrote in 2015, was <clears throat> ideas are the currency of the 21st century mm -hmm. because you you really it's like you said every everything will eventually be made redundant there is nothing that will not be made redundant eventually even plumbing even like surgery all these things are, are gonna robots are gonna eventually do well yeah and, i actually saw a bureau of labor statistics report that electricians will be obsolete in like 15 years yeah, because they'll just they'll just have robots that crawl around your wire walls. They find the the wiring issues. They go in through the outlets and they fix everything. Yeah, and even like even things like therapy, it's, it's you know there's like AI engines that are right. that are getting really good at it. But uh, uh, you know, it, it's sort of like we've been cursed with the word capitalism to describe our society. You know who came up with the word capitalism? I'm pretty sure it was Karl Marx in in his his manifesto. He he basically referred to capitalism as this system where some people are accumulating all the capital uh, at the expense of others, and that's right. called capitalism. I don't believe we're in a capitalist society. We're in an innovationist society. All of America's mm -hmm. success is through innovations, and so to be good in an innovationist society is not about being good at accumulating capital. It's about being good at coming up and executing on innovations. And by the way, people say ideas are a dime a dozen. Execution is everything. You can't execute without good execution ideas. Execution ideas are a subset of ideas. Some people execute quite poorly because they don't have good execution ideas. So 
you know, it's very important to exercise that muscle. And then further, if you share your ideas, everyone says, oh, I don't want to share my ideas. They'll steal them. Yes, people will steal your ideas. But if you're if you have an abundance mentality, you just have more ideas. Yeah. So stealing ideas, you one thing that's very interesting about Google, it's a very important lesson I've learned from Google, is that when you go to Google and you say, Google, please tell me about motorcycles, Google says to you, listen, I'm really sorry. We know nothing about motorcycles, but here are 10 other websites you should go to where you'll learn something about motorcycles. And they measure their success by how quickly you leave their website. But what site are you going to return to when you need to know about like STDs or whatever? You go back to Google. So, you know, you want to be the source, the place where people know, oh, this James has ideas. I'm going to go to him. He's the one who comes up with ideas. He sent us the list six years ago. Let's call him today yeah. and see what he thinks. And that happens. That happens to me now. I'm a very poor networker. This has been my primary technique for networking for 20 years. And it, it works. It's saved my life. It's worked incredibly well. So I'm surprised at how well this people are enjoying this site, but because I always like doing it in a waiter's bed, but I'm even enjoying doing it online now and sharing it and getting comments on it and seeing if people look at it and, and you know, all the social media stuff, but now combined with this idealist idea. So what I just detected is that if we need to, try, if we need to, if, if we lose James and we need to hunt him down, we need to go search the nearest biker bar because he's been Googling motorcycles and STDs. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Getting them in the, in the biker bars. Yeah. Are you sure? Are you, wife, sure, that's are you sure that's COVID? Are you sure it's COVID that you're contending with? Um, <laughs> no, seriously, no, th this is great. And, and um, this idea, the currency of ideas and the ability to generate ideas uh, and to iterate on ideas and to execute on ideas. I, I, I really, I mean, even, even to the ethos of my book, you know, which is about this creating your dream life in the modern world. I mean, in Entra, we have thousands of people coming in. And what, I'll tell you the hardest thing about Entra for me is we teach entrepreneurship, right? But people always want kind of a paint by numbers starting point. So we introduce them to business models that are scalable and malleable and adaptable and individual or, you know, customizable enough that thousands of people can do them without stepping on each other's toes, like let's say affiliate marketing or an, a, an yeah. agency or, right. But at the end of the day, if you really want to be a great entrepreneur, you're going to have to reach a point where you're not asking somebody else what to do. You're having to generate unique value and unique insight to the market. Uh, and, and that's, and really, to a large degree, what we're trying to do is get people to that starting line. You know, it's like the, the greatest measure of our success will be how many people can we actually get to the point where they don't need us anymore? Yeah. And, 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 and my point is, man, if there is one X factor, like you said, that can pretty much guarantee your viability and your, and your opportunity in the future, it's the ability to come up with ideas. Yeah, it's so important. And it's, I see it not only save my life, but you see that a lot of people on Notepad make lists about how Notepad has already helped them. It's only been around, like, for most people, a few weeks or a month or two. And I've been really surprised and, and, and pleased by it. So, you know, it, it, it's interesting because, you know, I should have, and, and now I'm starting to I could visualize this now as a business. And so that starts to come up with, then I start to come up with ideas like, okay, let's allow people to make idealist premium. So then what does that mean? Well, they can make an online course or they can make a special report, or if they're a writer, they can have a, a, a premium chapter of one of their books. And this is a way they could build community around mm -hmm. their audience. There's, it's very hard to do that for, for most writers. So once you start visualizing things, ideas also start to happen and, and, that goes hand in hand with writing these idealists. And, you know, I appreciate your, in your book, you mentioned uh, the, the power of visualization in, in entrepreneurship. If you tell people do this, this, and this, and you'll make a lot of money, still only one out of 10 people or less will do it because they'll have excuses. They won't believe that it's possible for them. They won't quite visualize themselves as, as business people. They don't have the confidence for some reason. And 
it's just like investments. If I say, hey, you should buy ABC stock, just buy it and hold it. It's going to make a lot of money. It's the simplest instruction in the world. Still only one out of 10 people will make money on it because they'll try to time when they get to, when they get in, they'll try to time when they get out, they'll have bad habits or they'll get depressed and they'll sell. They'll say to themselves, oh, the whole market's falling apart. I better sell this and I'll buy it back later. So visualization is so important for all that we do, whether it's coming up with ideas, building a business, being a better athlete or musician or chess player or whatever. I like that you mentioned that in your book quite a bit. Well, you know, one thing that just occurred to me, and, and thank you, I, I appreciate that, but, but I mean, it's a skill, right? It's, it's a muscle too, the, the visualization, yeah. the imagination muscle. One thing that occurred to me, I had uh, Ed Milet on the show a oh, couple of weeks ago. That. I think it's actually, I think that interview- Power of One More. Yeah, yeah, Power of One More. But one of the things Ed <laughs> said that really landed with me was the reason we're happy when we're children is because we live, we, we approach life from a place of creativity and imagination. And the reason we get less happy over time is because we stack history and memories on top of creativity and imagination. When you're a kid, you don't have history. You don't have memories because you, you haven't been alive that long, right? And for what you were, you don't really remember. But the more we live in a place, you know, our, our, our cognitive file cabinet gets filled up with history and memories it, it kind of like sucks our energy into the past. There's no excitement in the past because it's coming on, right? And so what I feel like, I'm wondering if one of the sort of underlying qualities and effects of your idea generation application is, or your idea facilitation application is that it's actually rewiring us back into a space of imagination and creativity. And that part of what makes it so fun to use is that it's, it's actually allowing us to be more childlike in a way. Yeah. I never thought of it that way, but that's absolutely right. And I think, I think that is what is what kickstarts this idea of muscles that you're playing in a sandbox again. It's like, mm -hmm. I could write, I could do anything in these idealists. I don't have to execute on any of them. It's just an, it's just exercise. It's just making an idealist. I'm not going to write any of these novels yesterday that I described about the Bible. Right. I'm a hundred percent chance I'm not going to write any of them. It's just, just me playing. It's so, like 10, 10 possible industrial applications for ground up toenails. Well, yeah, Why exactly. <laughs> well, there's a, there's a guy on the site who just, you, he had a very creative idealist and now he's making a book out of it. There's already been like two or three books written as wow. a result of idealists. That's kind of feel good. One guy who's one of the initial people, he said, okay, I'm going to make, I don't know whether it's 40 or 50 recipes. He's going to take, combine two cuisines, like let's say Mexican and Japanese. He's going to throw them into an AI engine, have it come up with like this recipe for sushi burritos, like burritos that are sushi. And it comes up with the full recipe, gives you all the ingredients and instructions. And then there's another AI engine called Dal E which has a picture. If you say, show me a sushi burrito, it'll make a picture of a sushi burrito, like using AI. Mm -hmm. And he's using all of this and he's writing the, idea, we call it idea sex. He's writing the International Idea Sex Cookbook. And he's publishing it. He's going to self-publish it on Amazon. So in basically a week's time, he's written the book. He's got 40 recipes. And based on his idea list, it's probably... Uh, I'm sure some of the, uh, them are on recent lists right now because he's been writing the list every day. And uh, uh, he's going to publish the book. Wow, that's that's got to feel pretty good um, for you. I mean, yeah, it, it, advancing, uh, advancing civilization. Um, well, James, this has been a, a really epic conversation. I appreciate all the time. I, I know what we had originally budgeted, and I'm grateful that neither one of us had too hard of a stop in our schedule because this has been a lot of fun. Yeah, um, obviously, we, we talked about NotePD. We talked about a lot of your books. Uh, where else can people go? Where would you like people to go, given the plethora of things that you have out there um, to come find you these days? Uh, I guess go to NotePD.com, Notepad.com. <laughs> yeah, this is cool. It's so, I mean, I'm looking at, uh, well, whatever. I I'm looking at the site. Like, it's totally addicting. I, I actually need to not look at it too much. I can tell already. There was, there's a guy that said, I just refreshed it, but there was books I'm reading. That, some guy wrote down 10 jokes that were hilarious. Uh, Reasons I support cryptocurrency, the greatest Puccini arias. Oh yeah. 
here's this guy who made some music. Um, nine ways to become an expert. Uh, oh, 10 yeah. Chapters, 10, 10 chapter ideas for a book, working title, unblocked. Uh, 14 things I learned about writing. Uh, I like this one, top 10 chips. That's interesting. I love that idea of like, like brainstorming chapter ideas for a book. Yeah. Yeah, because then people add to it too. Like you could fork off of other people's lists and keep adding to it. Uh, seven things I'm pondering today. Classes they should mm. require in college rather than the traditional. Uh, we didn't even get into education, but this is good stuff. So yeah, it's um, just interesting to me each day, like seeing what people come up with. Sometimes it's like some people do like random Wikipedia searches and then write what they learned. And it's just all fun. Yeah. You know, that you know, this would be a great, like if I was going to write, like if I was going to make a list of like 10 things to do when you got home from being laid off, like one of them would be to go to this website. That's a good because, idea, actually. Because I think it, it, just, it just orients you toward possibility. Okay. I'm going to tell you something very interesting. So, um, uh, hold on one second. So I've been writing idealists every day for 20 years, right? So here's from 2015, 10 things to do if you were fired today. Huh? It's hard to come up with, with a list I haven't thought about at some point. Well, but, well, I mean, yeah, I, I would imagine so. That's what, that's in 20 years, 10 a day, that's 773,000 ideas or something, or yeah, 73,000 I mean, lists. I'm even putting in the chat, 10 things to do if you were fired yesterday. It's from 2015. Huh, how cool. Yeah, yeah, I mean, but I think a lot of it, I mean, even that's a good example of like, you know, I like imagination is very, uh, is very related to state, you know, to your emotional and physiological state. And, and, and being in the habit of, of, of developing ideas and, and having ideas and even having a big repository of ideas the times you need ideas the most are probably the times they're hardest to come up with because of your state. That's the thing too, is like, now that I have this site, I really feel accountable to write on this site every day. So last night I was just not in the mood to write. I had a, had a fever, again, COVID. I for, had forgotten already for the day. So I, it was late, I should have been asleep. Right. I'm like, no, I gotta do it. And so I had to write uh, my list. So it keeps me, it keeps me accountable and I'm glad because I don't want the muscle to atrophy. Yeah, that's very cool. Well, I, 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 I just got to say, man, again, I, I so appreciate this. I, I hope that, I don't know, I don't know what the thumbnail will end up looking like, but I, I was going to say, we should call this the COVID sessions, yeah. but actually if we do that, it'll probably, I don't know, the whole interview will probably get banned or deplatformed. Oh yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. You can get in trouble, <laughs> but no, this has been so much fun, James. Thank you. Um, I would say uh, we got to do this again, but I think I'm actually coming on your show tomorrow. So yeah, <laughs> uh, maybe I should let you go get book. some rest. Well, Jeff, thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. As always, it's such a pleasure to coming on the show. I, I, I love your content and, and everything. So, so looking forward to you coming on my podcast tomorrow. So we'll see you then. Yeah, we'll pick it up tomorrow. Thank you again, James. And especially to all of you viewers and listeners out there, as I tell you every time, you're the best part of this show. You're why I do what I do every day. I'm so grateful we got to spend this time together. I can't wait to do it again. Take care. Thanks to generous community support, Wounded Warrior Project has helped post 9-11 veterans and their families since 2003. Through no-cost physical and mental health services, legislative advocacy, career assistance, and life skill training. We're there every step of the journey. It's possible to feel understood. To get support when it's needed most. And now I know anything is possible. And we're just getting started. Learn more at woundedwarriorproject.org slash together. Make room in your closet because Clear the Rack is on at your Nordstrom Rack store. For a limited time, find incredible deals on Wear Now styles. We're talking the latest trends from your favorite brands, now on sale for even less at Nordstrom Rack. Take an extra 25% off red tag clearance throughout the store, including styles from Vince Camuto, Mark Fisher LTD, Stuart Weitzman, and more. All sales final. The best stuff goes fast, so shop this sale at Nordstrom Rack today. Please see NordstromRack.com or ask a store associate for details.